Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is consciousness after death. I'm very happy to be with my guest, Imad Sparus, a professor of psychology at King's University College at the University of Western Ontario in Canada. He is the author of many books, including Alterations of Consciousness. Science as a Spiritual Practice. The Impossible Happens, a scientist's personal discovery of the extraordinary nature of reality. He is co-author with Julia Mossbridge of Transcendent Mind, Rethinking the Science of Consciousness. Another book is Radical Transformation, The Unexpected Interplay of Consciousness and Reality, and his most recent book, published by the American Psychological Association, is Death as an Altered State of Consciousness. Imans lives in Ontario, Canada, and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Imans. It's a pleasure to be with you once again. It's been a while. Well, thank you for inviting me, Jeffrey. Uh, I always love talking to you, and I loved talking to you in person last week in Indiana. That was so fantastic that we could be together. That was wonderful at the Society for Scientific Exploration. And I have to commend you. You have been an incredible pioneer in breaking through, in particular, the American Psychological Association, a conservative organization that has rarely been friendly toward parapsychology and, and certainly not towards the, the whole question of consciousness after death. But now they've published your book, Death as an Altered State of Consciousness, and I hope that there are courses offered on that topic all across North America. I feel I've been uh, very fortunate in that regard, that um, early on I decided to try to ask them to publish one of my books, and, and they did, and so since then I've had a very good relationship with them. It's a coup. Very few people have had as much success with that organization as you have had. But, of course, it's important to acknowledge the uh, summary of parapsychological research that they published in 2018, put together by Edsel Cardenia, who uh, had been editor of the Journal of Parapsychology. Yes, I, I, I think from from my perspective, I also think it's important to make a distinction between the American Psychological Association and the books division, APA Books, which publishes the books. And I feel that their, at least with regard to their attitude toward me, has always been one of respect and one of looking at the quality of scholarship and not so much whether I'm towing some kind of acceptable sort of ideology, ideological line or not. And, and so I, I feel that there has been a great deal of integrity that I have experienced with APA books in that regard, that it's the quality of the scholarship that concerns them, uh, the timeliness and value of the topics, uh, and, and not so much whether what kind of ideological take someone is taking. Well, I think their openness to your work uh, is a sign of the changing zeitgeist uh, in, in which we live. And I think of it as a, a positive sign. I know you begin your book by pointing out that the conventional view in psychology is that there is no such thing as consciousness after death. After death is only oblivion. Yeah, I mean, I'm... I, I, I'm very careful to frame the way in which I talk in this book around the way in which people ordinarily understand the way things are. And so, of course, I acknowledge that and I say, okay, this is how we think about it usually. Are there other ways we can think about it? 
And the answer is yes, there are other ways we can think about it. And we are allowed to explore those. We're not, we're not just committed to the usual, you know, kinds of conventions that we have in psychology now. And in fact, you take some time to point out that conventional thinking in psychology and in many other disciplines is often incorrect. It is. That's right. And I mean, I think that, I mean, science is sort of a forward moving process of the acquisition of knowledge. And we can get stuck along the way and not move forward sometimes for a while. And so I see that as kind of natural process. I mean, I'm sure that somebody, you know, 50 years from now will look at what I write and laugh and say, well, he really thought that, you know, like, because I think that will change again as we move forward, as our understanding develops. Um, so I, I'm, I, I don't, I, I'm not so concerned about, you know, do we have a correct version of reality? Because all our versions of reality are going to be incorrect. It's just a question of how badly incorrect are they? Well, you draw upon a 150-year history of psychical research and parapsychology, and it suggests that uh, we actually have a lot of data that points towards the potential for survival of consciousness after death. Yes. Shall I elaborate? Sure. I think a couple of things like one is that I, I really try to use uh, contemporary information as much as possible. Uh, one approach I could have taken was to do a sort of a, a historically oriented review to start with the late 1800s and go to today. But I chose not to do that because that's the way I think people usually present this material. And then everybody gets bogged down with, you know, the debates in the 1910s and 20s and stuff. And, I didn't want that. I just wanted, let's just look at the phenomena. Let's think about the phenomena. What is the best information that we have today in looking at and draw in historical material where that really, you know, helps to illuminate something. So I, I spend a little bit of time, for example, talking about the birth of spiritualism, um, because just because that had been so influential in the way people have been experiencing and thinking about some of these phenomena. So yeah, I do that, but I try to use the contemporary information and and then you know i think i think it was kind of also an interesting experience for me because as i go through the book chapter by chapter so you sit down and you're you're you know down in the weeds with this stuff and then you come up for air and then you write the next one and you're down in the weeds and come up and down and up and down and, and with each iteration it's kind of like oh wow yeah that's interesting yeah that's interesting that's interesting and it sort of has this cumulative effect so that as i say at the end of the book it's kind of like you realize that the psyche, that who we are, is much more expansive and expanded than we ordinarily think that it is. And for, so just from looking at all of these experiences that people have had and the kinds of data that have been gathered and the kind of studies that have been done, it really shows that the psyche is much richer, deeper, um, more variegated, interesting, complex, and so on than we usually think that it is. And that includes this kind of like physical form that we have is just kind of like an afterthought almost. It's like to whatever else is going on. Well, one approach that I know some scholars, even parapsychologists, take to this data, and it's really a contemporary argument, is that all the data that points to an afterlife, consciousness surviving death, also uh, could be interpreted as talking about the powers of living individuals, because the data is always filtered through the minds of living people. Exactly, um, Jeffrey, and that is the so so I, I guess I, I do two things in the book. One is I simply want to expose people to the phenomena themselves that are associated with death. So deathbed visions, uh, after-death communication, near-death experience, past life experience, those kinds of things. So I want them to know something about that. And so I try to give the best kind of uh, overview or 
introduction to that material. And the other one is I want to I want to take on this question of the survival hypothesis. Do we survive after death? And then what explanations do we have for these different things that we're looking at and thinking about here? Does life after death um, work as an explanation? And so I think people often don't realize that there is that intermediate position that that we as living agents have the capacity both for um, remote viewing, seeing things or gathering information in some kind of sixth sense kind of way, and remote influencing or PK or psychokinesis that we can actually affect things uh, in the world around us. And and so one of the things that we have to take into account when we look at these data is, is this just people who are alive doing things? Or is it people who are dead doing things? So, so the, the usual um, sort of uh, way of talking about that today, it used to be called a super psi hypothesis, that it's psychic abilities on the part of people that create these phenomena. Uh, now the expression is living agent psi, LAP, living agent psi. So it's the people who are living who are creating this. So my question then is, is it LAP or DAP? Is it living agent psi or dead agent psi? Who's, who's doing, who is psychokinetically moving this? Is it the person who's alive or the person who's deceased? And in some cases, this is very difficult to determine. Um, so I've done reg, I've run reg studies, and in one of the reg studies, one of the participants couldn't get the reg to go the direction she wanted to. So reg is the random event generator. It's used typically in research to try to show that you know uh, micro PK or uh, PK at at a, a low level, like quantum level, uh, really does exist. Um, and she was stuck, couldn't get it to go the way she wanted to. So she just called on some beings, and they moved it for her according to her. So, so you can you can sort of like which way round is it, right? Like, is this a reg experiment that turns into ITC, instrumental transcommunication, using electronic devices to talk to the dead, or is it ITC turning into reg? Like, which one is it? Because you know that whole area just kind of overlaps, right? So, yeah, so what I do is I set up this kind of dial. I talk about a dial. I say, okay, so we've got materialism as an explanation. Then we've got lap as an explanation, and we have survival as an explanation. And what happens throughout the book, so in each chapter, I, 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 I have a look at that dial. How far, did, how far were we able to turn it? It's pretty easy to turn it from materialism to lap. <laughs> There's just too much good documentation that strange things happen. The materialists are going to argue and say, no, 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 it's all misperception and mental illness and hoax and all the rest of it. But that's just kind of background noise at the point where you realize, no, this really is happening. So it's easy enough to get to lap. The problem, the really, really difficult problem is getting from lap to survival. And that requires a fair bit of finesse and, and sometimes very sort of complex philosophical arguments. Yeah, there is a way to approach it scientifically, but a really nice aspect of your book is that you use a lot of personal accounts and case histories to e explain how uh, people who are having these paranormal experiences interpret what uh, occurs to them, how they come to grips with it. And almost always those people seem to be pointing towards the survival hypothesis. They are, but I think sometimes um, it's because they don't understand the power of the living agent psi hypothesis. And once you sort of talk to them about it, you explain it to them, then then they go, oh yeah, okay, maybe, yeah, you're right. You know, maybe it wasn't the dead people. But I think I think that there's also a level at which we just have an intuition about kind of are we interacting with someone or not like i feel i'm interacting with you right now but if i were to analyze that very carefully philosophically and epistemologically you could i don't know i i could be talking to myself you could be some kind of chat gpt thing that is you know but i don't feel that like i have a, i have a sense i have a feeling that i'm interacting sort of a, that kind of i thou relationship that boober talked about um 
you know, that there is someone who is like myself that I am interacting with. And I think that that's what, that's one of the things that I think people sort of feel like in these uh, after death communication, ADC presence, for example, that it, that it really is someone. It's not just, you know, a hallucination or a feeling or their own whatever creating it. Some of these cases are very distinct. You report on uh, uh, the medium, uh, is it McCarthy? Who, I, I've interviewed her myself, uh, who wrote a wonderful book about her, her fiancé died. And then he began communicating with her. And, and she had a very distinct sense that this is a person who she knew very well. It took her a while to reach that conclusion, though. Um she didn't believe it at first when all of these kinds of interesting forms of communication started occurring for her. And by, but by the end of it, she was convinced. She also realized she had mediumship skills and became a medium. Um, and then, you know, was convinced, for instance, that it was her deceased fiancé who helped to find her an apartment that she really loved. Um, and that that wasn't just a, a strange string of coincidences that she managed to somehow, you know, create herself. So, so yeah, but she didn't start out that way. I mean, she started out as a skeptic and it took her a fair bit, you know, over and over again, having these kind of significant uh, events that would occur uh, around her, um, you know, such as butterflies crashing into her forehead and landing on her feet and so on. Uh, that finally kind of convinced her that, yeah, no, no, it's him. It's him. Not only was she a skeptic, as I recall, she was a rather hard-boiled war reporter. You'd probably agree with me. That is one of the best written books that I've ever read. I mean, you can tell that she has, she has developed her writing skills as a journalist really, really well uh, and writes extremely well uh, and effectively. Yeah, the book is, ex is very, very well written. The fact that she had to struggle with it also reminds me of another person you write about, Whitley Strieber, who I've had the pleasure of interviewing many times. And his wife, Anne, died, and she began to communicate to him. And they had an arrangement prior to her death that if one of them died, they would, if possible, try to communicate, but they wouldn't do it directly because Anne told him, I know that if you communicated with me directly, I wouldn't believe it. And if I communicate with you directly, I don't think you would believe it either. So why don't we try to communicate through a third party? It'll be more believable if it happens that way yes and they did uh, until he was convinced and once he was convinced he had this kind of telepathic communication with her i think this kind of i think one of the things that struck me as i was reading all of these cases across these different kind of types of anomalous phenomena is how people end up in this sort of telepathic uh domain and that includes people who um, were involved in ITC. They start out with ITC listening to stuff, you know, coming out of radios that just sounds like, you know, nonsense perhaps or like not much of anything. Um, and yet through that process of ostensibly and maybe interacting, maybe not interacting, they start to actually develop these telepathic skills apparently. Uh, of being able to connect with people who are deceased. And so I just thought it was interesting that that, that, kind of, that that kind of progression seems to exist for people. But yeah, I mean, if you start with a skeptic and they get telepathic information, they're not going to, they're just going to dismiss it. So, uh, so that, but that seems to be like almost like an end state or like a, a further development of people's interactions with those who are deceased. Well, and because I think we live in a culture that's primarily materialistic in nature, uh, especially here in North America, uh, that kind of a struggle is, is going to occur to almost everybody who, who begins to open up to the paranormal. Oh, yeah, I think it's a normal process. Yeah, of course. And I, and I, think, and I respect that. I respect that. And I respect that readers are going to be at different points along that sort of curve if you want to think of it that way and some of them will simply just 
well, they're not going to read the book if they reject it outright. So, but so, you know, they're going to go like, yeah, yeah, no, this is, you know, and then they'll go like, no, no, I've had experiences like that, and then so on. So I think that, I think that there's, it's important to be sensitive to the range of attitudes that readers are going to bring to this, and I feel that I, I'm just kind of good at very neutrally sort of addressing that and allowing for the scope of those kinds of attitudes because I've been teaching this for 35 years <laughs> or teaching strange things for 35 years and I have all kinds of students in my classes and I have to get along with them so I have to learn to speak to them and and to show them that what I'm saying is reasonable it is not just outrageous that it's reasonable and so I've sort of developed I think uh, a style of approaching this material that helps people to be introduced to it in a non-threatening way and to be able to sort of go, okay, well, I can, I can see that. So then they go, okay, let me, let me absorb this next step. I can't absorb that, but anyway, I'm here. <laughs> I recall when I was a college student myself beginning to look at phenomena of this sort, uh, I was indoctrinated uh, from an early age with a kind of mechanistic uh, way of looking at the world. And uh, it took me a, a long time to come to grips with the idea that there might be something going on that is completely independent of material causation. Jeffrey, uh, I think that, you know, I think that we underestimate, We great, those of us who've been through the university system, we greatly underestimate the conditioning and sort of dogmatism that we ourselves are engendered with as a result of that process. So I spent 12 and a half years full time in university in the sciences um, and then psychology, which you, know, you could argue whether it's a science or not. It's supposed to be, we like to think of ourselves as scientists. Um, and certainly that's how I approached it, but I mean, that is it. That is it. This is a big machine. We live in a big machine. Everything's mechanical. That's the way it is. That's just the background to everything that you, how you think and what you do and whatever you're doing. And, and it conditions us. So even when strange things happen, you go, well, that's just one of those things. John. And so on. And you, you keep discounting it over and over again because of the power of those background, that background ideology that has been engendered into us through the university system, through our educational system. And, and we underestimate the power of that even when we intellectually realize both its influence and we realize that these phenomena are really happening. And yet we still go like... <laughs> That's why I like the concept of a boggle threshold. You can know as much as you want to know, and you can know all your limitations and everything else and accept it. But at the end of the day, there's a boggle threshold. You just go, well, I can accept that, but not that thing up there. No, 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 no. I see the evidence for it, but no, 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 no. It's just a, a bridge too far. to use a metaphor uh, from the war. Right. <laughs> and a lot of this is a battle, a battle with ourselves, and sometimes a battle with other, you know, people who we have to sort of <laughs> work our way, work our way with and through. Well, one of the arguments that I, I know has been raised within the parapsychology community is that a belief in spirits uh, often gives a person permission to access their own normal psychic ability. So if I believe in living agent Psy, I might say it's good to believe in spirits, even if it's not true, because it helps you get over the hurdle that uh, you, uh, a little skin encapsulated ego, can't possibly perform anything paranormal. Well, yeah. Anything, anything. I mean, uh, I'm sure that you are aware of the experiments done by uh, Bacheldor, uh in uh, Scotland, where he had an accomplice. These are table levitation experiments. He asked people to put their hands on the table and, and tell them to levitate the table. Of course, you can't levitate things. That's just nonsense. 
So he has an accomplice push the table up without everybody else knowing. And then now the table's floating, everybody's going, oh, it can happen, it can happen. And now the accomplice doesn't have to do anything, the table's levitating. <laughs> so yes, I mean, there are, if we can sort of get past this, this is like uh, one of the other interviews we had, I think. I was talking about my idea of meaning fields, that there's a very powerful meaning field that we create about how we think reality works. And it holds everything nicely in place. And so to get out of it, you sort of have to rattle it or, you know, get out of that meaning field, get into another one, like, and it, it might take a little bit to rattle it in order to stop forcing it, you know, on yourself. I, I remember at uh, one of the consciousness meetings, uh, and I won't mention the person's name, although I'm sure that person <laughs> would be proud of what they said, but they went up to the microphone at one point and said, look, why don't you just accept materialism as the real version of reality, and you'll find out that it works. And I'm going, well, of course it works. <laughs> you just forced everything into a particular way of being around you how is anything else going to slip through one of my professors uh, when I was a graduate student in parapsychology was Michael Scriven a philosopher and he said materialism is is like imperialism that it, it's going to dominate and no matter what evidence you come up with sooner or later it'll get incorporated within a materialistic framework even, even if it means that space and time become very different from what we think of them today the materialists will ultimately find a way to get comfortable with all this paranormal data and, and work it into their own framework. Yeah, I mean, you even see that in physics. I mean, it's the, you know, the billiard ball version of the world came apart in the late 1800s. But, you know, this has not really shifted anybody's, you know, uh, convictions. Um, yeah, it's kind of like, um, like the... Saturn eating his own children, kind of like everything just gets devoured. <laughs> no matter what it is, yeah, we'll just we'll just devour it. We'll just use it somehow. We'll we'll account for it in some way or other. But I think my my favorite here, my one of my favorites here is uh, the temporal temporal anchors. So in a near death experience, sometimes people will see things happening in the operating room or wherever they are that uh, turn out to be correct, and the explanation for that, I mean, uh, if you want the references, you, they're in the book, but uh, I'm trying not to mention people's names here. But one of the proposals is that, you know, so here you've got a body without a heartbeat. And if there's no heartbeat within 20 seconds, there's no brain activity, which is sufficiently substantial to give you any kind of experience in any kind of meaningful sense. And, and yet this theory is, well, sure, we can accommodate that. That corpse, they don't use the word corpse at this point, but that's what it is. <laughs> this corpse receives the information, you know, about, you know, whatever, wherever the dentures are, or, you know, the physician standing with their arms crossed in a doorway or whatever, receives this information through sort of their, through their senses. <laughs> and then later incorporates that information into a narrative that makes it sound as though they actually floated around the room and saw it. Like, so that's how a materialist explains these temporal anchors. And they don't seem to have a problem with it. And they have lots of research money to keep going with it. I, and that's probably going to be true for a long time. That uh, it seems as if every couple of weeks I hear about a, uh, an important study that some materialist has now come up with the, for example, the location in the brain that creates out of body experiences, so so that they can as you call it, a temporal anchor, some way of grounding the mysterious uh, within a materialistic viewpoint. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like bringing everything, oh, yeah, yeah, we know all about this. This is just the brain doing its thing, and this is how it does it. Now that we've shown you that 
we know how the brain does it. That's the end of the discussion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you have some great stories in, in your book. As I recall, you start out with the story of Bruce Grayson, who's now practically retired. He spent the last half century exploring the near-death experience, but there was a time when he was a young doctor right out of graduate school and uh, uh, with a materialistic outlook like uh, practically all doctors are uh, trained to have, uh, when his worldview was completely shattered by an experience. I thought I would start with that. Um, first, because he is so highly regarded uh, you know, as a near-death experiences researcher and, and one of the people who started all of that research and who, you know, stuck with it even when it would have been more beneficial to his career not to do so. Um, and and the, the enormous contributions he's made to our understanding of that material, but also just to show the importance of personal experiences. And the importance of personal experiences not just for the people who become participants in our studies, but but for the people who are doing the studies. And so uh, I like this example where, um, you know, he has to examine a girl who has tried to commit suicide uh, and she is not in any state to have any perceptions of him and yet the next day reports the spaghetti stain on his tie that, and he even had that covered up. She said she saw that occur in the dining room where he was eating his spaghetti when he was called in to attend to her. So, so yeah, so I, I like that example because, because Bruce is so highly regarded and because it shows how you can have different attitudes toward these experiences. You can just blow them off, you know, it's just a jaw, just one of those things, and I'm not going to think about it. That clearly didn't happen. <laughs> or you can reflect on it and say, does this tell me something about reality that I didn't already know? And if it's very sort of direct and convincing and clearly anomalous, and you know it is, nobody else believes you, of course. They all think you're either making it up or you, you misperceived something or whatever. But for you, you were there. You saw it. It happened you know what the explanations are and you know they don't work. There has to be something more going on. So it kind of opens up. I, I feel it kind of creates this opening into this material by starting with that example. In fact, I'm under the impression that for most people, reading all of the evidence is helpful, but it's not going to convince them as much as a personal experience would. Right, and, and we have research from uh, NDE research uh, for that. So the person who has the near-death experience, it's like, yeah, this is it. like there's, like they are there. That's it. They're toast. They're finished. The caregiver, the person who was there, you know, when they had the heart attack and who attended to them for you know three months afterwards while they were recovering and the whole thing, um, that person goes, yeah, yeah, there's something here. Then that person tells someone else, and that someone else goes, mm, yeah, maybe. And then you write it in a book, and somebody reads it, and they go, well, it's just a book. So it's like, so there is actually, that has been noticed, that there is that distance effect. Like, how close are you to the fire? How close are you to the experience itself? And for the people who have had the experiences, whatever the experiences they are, they go, whoa, okay, yeah. But what I was saying earlier about this conditioning, that for those of us who have been in the university system for so long, you can have the experience and you still go, well, I had the experience, but I don't know. I, I do remember an instance when Uri Geller uh, came to the physics department at Berkeley while I was a graduate student. and bent a ring, right in uh, a ring that belonged to a professor, right in front of his eyes. It, it bent. And he turned to everybody in the room and he said, if anybody else had uh, had had this happen to them, I and I had was a witness, I would tell them they need to take a vacation. Uh, <laughs> said, but I saw it. It really happened. And the next thing I know, the man has gone off on a vacation. 
<laughs> and when he came back, he said, no, it didn't really happen. Rhea White found that as well when she was interviewing athletes who had had unusual experiences uh, with whatever athletic activity they were involved in. They would tell her about these really interesting things that had happened on the football field or whatever. And then when she came back to you know record it and, and, and note it and write it down, they said, no, nothing happened. So there is that issue. But you report on some really strong cases. You report, for example, on the research of Ian Stevenson, who spent practically half a century looking at some of the strongest cases we have for reincarnation, many of which are accompanied by physical evidence. Well, he's certainly the giant when it comes to past life experiences. And, um, and I, 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 and one of the things he was particularly interested in were these um, uh, birth birth anomalies and sort of congenital defects. I'm, I'm trying to be careful with the wording that I'm using here. Um, trying to remember the right, the correct phrases to use now. Um, and, sort of, and birthmarks that people had that seemed to relate to the manner of death of the previous personality that the person appeared to have been in a previous incarnation. Those really struck me as being interesting. And it's particularly as a two volume uh, book about that with color plates in it. And, you know, the accompanying very careful documentation about statements that the child made and so on. And so I, I opened that chapter about past life experience with the example of Hanumant uh, Sixena, um, uh, who in, in northern India, who I believe it's northern India, uh, who uh, had a pattern of birthmarks on his chest. And the previous personality who he thought he was had been shot through the chest with a shotgun, and that is how he died. And the pattern matched, it wasn't perfect, it wasn't a perfect match, but it matched the uh, medical examiner's drawing of where the pellets had entered the the chest, his his pattern of birthmarks matched the pattern drawn by the medical examiner. And so you have this sort of objective link now. It's not just that the child is behaving as though, you know, they were that person, which he did in in many respects, that he thought that like like the 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 deceased person's mother, like he had a really good relationship with her, would go over and visit and those kinds of things. But also you have this kind of physical link. And I think that that's, that's really interesting. It's not clear. I mean, even if we accept reincarnation as a thesis, why you would want shotgun wounds on your chest in your next incarnation? Like, that's beyond me. But, uh, you know, it does create this very interesting um, dynamic of trying to understand what these connections can be between these people who are living out lives at different time periods. It's, it's quite mysterious, especially when you take into account that uh, sometimes the, the marks on the body of the previous person are artificial. They're, for example, drawn in charcoal or lipstick by one of the relatives of the deceased person. And then later on, a young child uh, has the memories of that person and has a, a birthmark or a mole or something that, that corresponds to uh, an, uh, something that was artificial officially put on the body of the deceased person. Yeah, and, and I, I comment in the book that that seems even stranger to me. If the person is deceased and then it's applied, then how does it become part of what's transferred? If you think like, okay, if, if they're shot, you know, at that point they're still conscious or whatever and they're experiencing, you know, this happening to them and then that kind of somehow, the, because it's a traumatic event, it may have more sort of significance or importance, and so it gets transferred over. But here, somebody's just, you know, it's usually like from the bottom of a pot or something. Let's just put some soot on the person's, you know, lower leg by the ankle here, and then check all the kids who are born over the next couple of years. You know, like, how does, how does that get transferred? 
Well, and culture seems to play a role because in, in the cultures where that practice exists, there's a, a cultural belief to support it. And among uh, indigenous people in North America as well, I believe, um, uh, not so much with regard to the marking practice, but they look for announcing dreams, for instance, like whether, um, you know, somebody who is going to be born, whether they are actually somebody coming back or not. And so that's one way of keeping track of, you know, what's happening to the people in your tribe. <laughs> there are also anomalies where, you know, you get um, what, and, and um, uh, Bruce Grayson has pointed out some of them in a recent article in Edge Science where, you know, you can have, you know, a number of people who all appear to be, I think which around which way it is, the uh, uh past lives uh well first of all you can have past lives that are coexistent so i was this person and this person but they happen to their lives overlap so you've got people who are uh, apparently had you know two past lives at once going on <laughs> so there are these kinds of anomalies with this it's not nearly as neat and tuck as you would like to think even if you're if you accept the idea of reincarnation what you're pointing at, I think, may be related to a, um, a profound idea that one finds in the perennial philosophy and the wisdom of mystics of every age that we're all part of one consciousness. Larry Dossi wrote the book, One Mind, that, that we all share. Uh, do you, I, I'm not sure that you explored that in this particular book, although I can't imagine you haven't paid attention to that idea. No, I didn't really do much with that. Uh, uh, the idea being that there is a universal consciousness and that we're sort of like ladled out bits of that universal consciousness and there can be different types of reconnection with that sort of universal consciousness. That there is only one eye. Uh, there aren't all these separate eyes. Um, yes, I'm very familiar with that. Um, and, and so, I mean, the other thing is if you, if you just look at time, well, what do you mean by time? <laughs> what is time? It's as Julie and I, in Chapter 3 of Transcendent Mind, another book uh, book that we wrote together, we examined the idea of time, that linear time is probably just not happening, that, that you need to think about it in different ways. But as soon as you try to think about it in different ways, then you go, well, what's a past life then? If everything is happening now, what's a past life? Like, you can have any, any number of past lives with any, any number of different configurations. So, there's no reason why it has to be just a single person. So, there are different ways of approaching how you could resolve that in the context of a greater kind of idea that both, not just that we are a single consciousness, but that the way in which that consciousness is split up using our sort of space-time ideas is already artificial and incorrect, that we have to think about it in different ways. And so, once you've sort of melted it all down use your philosopher's stone to you know to come back to the primitive material what you've got is some kind of reality which is going on with consciousness in it that expresses itself in all kinds of variegated ways um, and that becomes a much more flexible model or way of thinking about this and when we talk about death as an altered state of consciousness, one, one of the points you make is for, that from the many accounts we now have, certainly time seems very different from those who are on the other side. It does, and yet they talk about sequences of events that we would ascribe temporality to. And so I find that I, I'm not sure what to do with that. Um, but I think that the kind of, uh, and I alluded to Saturn eating his own children uh, earlier, I think that that kind, of, that kind of time no longer exists. That kind of like uh, uh, inevitability of sort of the progression of time and that you're subjected to it, that, that kind of subjectedness, it seems to me, is what gets released. We're no longer subjected to it. We choose to do something. There can be a sequence of events, but they're no longer sort of constrained by some kind of like, it's kind of like a conveyor belt. The conveyor belt of time is no longer there. Like that's that's the best way I have right now of trying to talk about it. Um, 
and and sometimes like the experiencer such as elizabeth uh crone will herself say well it, it i spent the equivalent of two weeks talking to this being who uh, appeared to her as her grandfather i believe um and and, and she goes well all that was during you know the few moments that she was unconscious have, having been struck by lightning <laughs> so even they will come back with time estimates of what they think the time lapse was in these other dimensions um so yeah it's not that you suddenly end it, enter this undifferentiated timeless domain where everything is just mushed together it isn't it's still variegated and distinct but not with the same kind of temporality that we have Earlier, you talked about dreams, announcing dreams that are often reported in reincarnation cases. Almost everybody experiences uh, dreams as an altered state of consciousness. And I know some philosophers have suggested that being in the afterlife is very much like being in a dream. Well, yes, I, I think that that is kind of the natural um, association to make. And I think the other thing, like when I teach the altered states course, the first altered state we talk about is sleep. It is the prototypical altered state of consciousness. It is clearly altered. It is clearly not the ordinary waking state because your body is not moving unless you're sleepwalking, right? But, um, you know, and your sensory input is very much attenuated, um, although there is still some. Um, and so what is this but you're still experiencing things frequently you will recall that you know in dreams uh, or some kind of mentation that occurs while you're asleep and that can be of various sorts um, so that seems to be the obvious parallel um, to you know death like what if death is just another altered state instead of just you know knocking the body out and it's still breathing what if it's knocked out and it's not breathing how much of it how much different would that be from dreams and that maybe we can learn about these what it might be like after death by looking at dreams and of course in some traditions in in the theosophical tradition for instance you have the idea that well yeah when you're asleep and dreaming your astral body leaves your physical body which I use the word double in the book. So your double is out there. Well, it's in this realm. It's doing things. You know, you can do things. You can talk to people. You can go visit. You can whatever. And that's and the way that and we interpret that as dreams. And the point being that when you die, the same thing happens. The double leaves and doesn't come back. So, you know, in your dreams, you're in the same place where all the dead people are. And so there's that kind of link that is sometimes made as well. Carl Jung seemed to suggest that uh, some dreams you might have about a deceased person and other dreams might be ones in which the deceased person is actually visiting you. And uh, Jung seemed to feel that he could tell the difference. He, he himself experienced a dream, I, I, I believe, of his father that he felt was one of those visitation dreams. I hear, I hear about that from my students a uh, fair bit. Uh, they'll go, yeah, uh, that was not an ordinary dream. That was a visit with my, you know, fill in the blank, grandfather, uncle, mother, whoever. Like, it's, it, people notice a difference in the quality of the interaction very frequently. But that could just be, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the dreams you're having where you don't notice that are also not dreams in a realm where all the dead people are. It could just be that you're, for some reason, better able to perceive that or to understand that in some kind of way. And I suppose as a psychologist, you always have to keep in, in the back of your mind the potential for self-delusion and, and folly that we all occasionally fall into. Well, Jeffrey, because this is an academic book and it's written for psychologists and, and for scholars and practitioners, mental health practitioners, one of the things that I do in every chapter is I say, is this pathology? 
is this some form of psychopathology? Is there something wrong with these people? And so I spend a considerable amount of energy and time in the book addressing that in every chapter, I think in every chapter. And and I think it needs to be addressed. We 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 it's so easy for us to fool ourselves and to think that something is happening when it isn't, or to think that something isn't happening when it is. Um, and so uh, I do that very carefully throughout the book. I go through the arguments for why this is some form of delusion or hallucination or misperception or whatever it is. And then I look at the evidence very carefully. And as you do that, pretty much in every chapter, you can say, okay, Maybe some of the cases fit those categories, but there's a residue. There are cases that do not fit. There is something about these experiences that is is clearly not just pathology or delusion or whatever that is that we want to attribute to it. There, there is a. It resonates like it. It, you know, you knock on it and it's it's solid. It doesn't fall apart, um, and that we need to respect that. One of the real, but again, in every chapter, when I say when these people go to a mental health professional, that is frequently how it's interpreted. You have a problem. You you need to fix the problem. You're you know stop you know thinking about the person who is now deceased or whatever, um, and and almost universally, um, or pretty much universally, people who've gone to mental health professionals come back and say that was not helpful. Or that was really that really messed me up. So I think that one of the things I'm really hoping will happen, given that this book is going out to mental health professionals, is that they will respect people's experiences. And I mean, and and if you know if if you're a psychotherapist or psychologist or psychiatrist or or occupational therapist or whoever who does or social worker who works in psychotherapy with people. You know what psychopathology looks like and the kinds of things you're supposed to look for. You know, things like the person has difficulty combing their hair in the morning and going to work. You know, like the kinds of things that tell you that there is something that is not working correctly with these people. Um, So you need to be able to separate those out from cases in which people are having some kind of anomalous experience that appears to ring true. And, and that the person appears to be genuinely having either an after-death communication of some sort or, you know, uh, a past life experience or, or whatever that might be. So, so yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's, I'm glad that you raised that because I just want to point out that that is very important that it be taken into account and that it need to be examined carefully. But when you do examine it carefully, you see that these experiences are not all just some form of mental disruption. Isn't it the case now that the manual of psychiatric disorders, I think published by the American Psychiatric Association, uh, takes things into account? Spiritual experience is considered a new category uh, separate from uh, psychopathology? Perhaps. I mean, it's a single code in the back of the DSM-5, which is that manual to which you're alluding. Um, I do think it's interesting, some of the language uh, for dissociative identity disorder, for example, that it appears that a person has, you know, alternate personalities that sometimes express themselves, or the person appears to be possessed. Okay, that kind of language wasn't there before. So there's a greater sensitivity to these kind of cultural variations and ways of thinking about people's um, experiences. And, and I mean, it's, we have a tendency toward pathomorphism, which is when we see something we don't understand, we think it must be a pathology. So we see shamans and we go, sick people. I have no idea. So it's this kind of like that colonization, right? That we're trying to lift now with the decolonization movement. You know, we just assume that, you know, because we're old white men from Europe who are erudite 
and professors at a university and like to write and talk to one another and think that we know everything and we can just come along and you know go oh yeah, yeah i know what that is well maybe you have no clue what that is and this is one of the things in teaching altered states of consciousness that i continuously emphasize to my students that we need to get away from pathomorphism and we need to look at what these experiences are in their essence or in their manifestation like what is happening here these are variations on a person's psychological expression and and we need to start respecting that those kinds of variations can exist and that they can be healthy and so in in particular for instance with schizotypal personality disorder um it has two factors uh if you look at it carefully so schizotypal personality disorder where people believe that strange things happen or they've had strange experiences or something of that sort it's very interesting so the two factors are you know one is dysfunction not being able to function properly which is pathological and having weird experiences and lo and behold when you split them apart and you and you take the people who have weird experiences but not the dysfunction they are actually turn out to be uh, more creative and psychologically healthier than ordinary people. That's a very important insight, and and it, it's the insight that uh, was first pointed out to me by Abraham Maslow in his book Toward a Psychology of Being, when he interviewed some of the most successful people in our society, people like Albert Einstein and Eleanor Roosevelt, and discovered that uh, key to their success were their own mystical experiences. I think he called them peak experiences. That, that book turned me around. It uh, really is uh, one of the important turning points uh, when I began to let go of the uh, materialistic, mechanistic worldview that I was brought up with. That was one of the uh, textbooks that I used when I first started teaching humanistic psychology here. I had the opportunity to meet Maslow after I uh, graduated uh, as an undergraduate, and I, I thought maybe I could somehow affiliate with him, but he took one look at me with my long hair and, and beard and anti-war attitude, and, and he said, no, I'm in favor of the uh, Vietnam War, and I don't want any uh, long-haired students working with me, so goodbye. <laughs> Ah, uh, don't we wish for that long hair now, Jeffrey? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's been a long time since I've had long hair. Well, I still have long hair, but there's not much of it. <laughs> Emons, this has been a great pleasure. I really would love to do more interviews with you. You've written so many wonderful books. I know we're just scratching the surface of, of the depth of your thought. Uh, so uh, you are welcome back on New Thinking Aloud anytime, and uh, I hope we can find more opportunities. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Likewise. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. You are the reason that we are here. <laughs> I imagine that by now, many of you already realize that, in conjunction with White Crow Books, we've just launched the new Thinking Aloud Dialogues book imprint, and our first title is, Is There Life After Death? <laughs>